Thanks everybody for making it out. And I'm really excited to introduce George, primarily as a, a fangirl of their work, but also as a friend. Um, they're gonna tell you a lot about the work they've done, so I won't have to belabor that, but just as a way of introduction, I think I first met George, we decided in 2012, when they were standing behind this table that was at this uh, cultural center in London, and on the table are these big bowls of this yellow stuff, which as an American, you don't have any idea what that is, but apparently it's called custard, and, <laughs> and there were like wires coming out of it, and uh, I think George had an apron on possibly, yeah, and was like getting people to like get, touch it and get very like messy and, and gross and actually play a game this way. And so that was like a, a kickoff for me of, of things that, that use food or, or different kinds of, of sensory experiences in games and uh, at the early part of the time when I was researching that. So that was always an, a very exciting introduction to George's work for me. Um, but since then, I've used other tools and techniques that George will tell us about, including cheap bots done quick, and played the game that they designed uh, with Sensible Object called Beast of Balance. So I hope you all will learn to appreciate George's work as much as I have. And with that, here's George. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Golan, and thank you, Heather, for giving me an introduction. Thank you, yeah, for coming out um, on the Thanksgiving week, which is obviously not a thing for me, but I, I do understand thanks what Thanksgiving is. Um, so yes, I'm George, George Buckingham. Um, so uh, there's kind of a bunch of different things that I do, and I kind of, I guess, could kind of categorize them as kind of like stuff to do with uh, like bots and kind of creative tools, stuff to do with games, and stuff to do with kind of curation. Um, and all of these obviously kind of messily overlap. Um, so I'm going to just kind of go through some of that stuff, demo some of that stuff. Um, so first off, I'm going to like kind of talk about some of the curation work that I've done. Um, so I started doing kind of curation, especially with like video game curation, um, with a group of people, um, group of friends, as part of the Wild Rumpus. So the Wild Rumpus, uh, we started, yeah, again, like 2000, 2012, that kind of time. Um, putting on kind of video game parties in London. Uh, so here's a selection of posters from our from our various events. So we since expanded and did some parties at uh, GDC, the Game Developers Conference. Um, done did some stuff actually with GDC, GDC themselves, and some kind of other spin-off events. Um, so I'll just show you some kind of pictures to kind of give you a sense. This is from uh, one of the parties that um, we did at GDC. So it kind of gives you a sense of the, the, the kind of feeling of it. So it's it's very much a club night. It's very much like you are in a bar. There is there is hopefully dancing. I consider it kind of a failure if we have one of our events and the dancing doesn't end up happening. Um, but there's also video games there. So it's kind of the social ex experience. Like it's very much, it's very much a party. Um, which other people were doing stuff similar to this when, when we started this, like uh, baby castles were definitely kind of operating in this space, but um, I don't know, I feel, feel proud of doing that, and I feel proud of, um, yeah, like the thing that's interesting about that is is using video games as a way of creating a social space that people can have good times in, um, and the focus is not on the video games. Like, as we did it, I came to realize like, Oh, actually, if if we host this party and somebody comes and they have a good time in the, in the evening and they play not a single video game, that's actually totally fine and we've still succeeded, like because they've had a good time, because they've watched video games. Um, so you end up with this kind of focus on like spectacle, on on different games that are really fun to watch as opposed to just necessarily fun to actually play themselves. Um, and also, yeah, also nice music as well. Like that's a good thing for a party generally. Um, so yeah, so and uh, kind of work from that work, I've now got involved with uh, Now Play This, which I do with uh, Holly Gramazio in London. So we've now had three uh, Now Play This, this is, and there's another one coming up uh, early next year. Um, still some details to be confirmed, but it's, it's looking likely. Um, so this is much more of a kind of um, day affair. This is an actual like exhibition, like a three day exhibition. Um, so yeah, I get, but again, it has this kind of thread of games as spectacle, games as things that you can come and watch just as much as you can do, 
um, where we've been most successful with the stuff we've shown, it's been, yeah, stuff that feels like an event, like a space that you enter into, um, and yeah, like stuff that, stuff that, yeah, gives you a context for appreciating that and for seeing stuff that's more than just the act of play itself, like um obviously we want to show interesting play experiences and like there's a big focus on showing cool stuff that's happening there but yeah it's providing the space um and the other so kind of side flip side to that is by showing the games we're also there's a, also kind of like a service to the to the creators of the games like by having these events like hopefully you manage to open up a kind of space where people can make games and you can kind of focus on the kind of cultural side of it so now play this is especially has this explicit aim of like yeah how can we how can we make video game people realize that games are culture and how can we make culture people also realize that video games are culture and hopefully come together and maybe like talk about that and talk about the things they have in common and we make a very deliberate point of like not segregating off here's like here's the physical games and here's the digital games and you know maybe they're in the same same exhibition but instead trying to mix them together and trying to i mean obviously try to find things that straddle the boundaries of that and don't neatly fit into either categorization um so i show you this just because it's it's a fun one no i won't because it's oh yeah so this is a uh, uh pippin bar who's a video game um a video game creator who's made lots of good games has done a series of tweets actually kind of different games ideas uh, so we hid a bunch of these around in the exhibition um, which actually then became a game in itself where um, there were kids running around trying to find all of the game ideas and we'd like hidden them in like creative places in it um, which is kind of yeah an example of stuff flowing through from video games into physical games into just a thing that kind of flows throughout the space um and also here's uh, some pictures from the the most recent one so we had stuff like a gigantic word search that filled an entire room um which was super cool yeah ada gomez made that it's called joyous here um so yeah so uh kind of moving on from that like um what else have we got here oh yeah that's more than play this stuff uh, so moving on from that an another kind of curation project i've done um was i mean i'm just now showing you uh, tweets that i've made in the past um <laughs> but it counts as a project because the tweets all have the same words in uh, <laughs> uh so it's it's a thing I, I did where i was just like you know i was super interested in twitter bots I, I still am and when i saw a good twitter bot i would tweet about it saying bot of the day and kind of try to talk a little bit about what makes it interesting uh, fitted within the tiny constraints of 140 characters um, back in the far off days when tweets were restricted to 140 characters um, so yeah like uh, and I can't actually remember I'm going to pretend for the sake of narrative that this predated me making the cheat bots done quick uh, which I'll get into in just a second but so yeah definitely this kind of interest in in these kind of wonderful twitter bots and kind of again in the kind of context there and, and twitter bots are wonderful because they exist within like this social context of like of your stream of twitter of the things that you're looking at on twitter anyway um and then there's like a bit of art that can slip in there or bots that respond to you or bots that are kind of playfully taking stuff that other people have posted and skewing it in some kind of way um yeah like this kind of thing of where it blurs into everyday life and i think they gain a lot of power from that over and above just some nice generative art that you go to the website or the gallery and stuff and you see the generative art and you're like yes this is cool which obviously can be great but uh, twitter bots have this extra kind of magic that you can harness there because because they already come with this built-in social context and they can operate on an equal terms with people which which is also kind of cool um so yeah so um from this uh also so this is one of the threads just being interested in twitter bots that led me to create uh, cheap bots done quick now cheap bots done quick uh i'll bring up the website so cheap bots done quick is a website that i've made a kind of platform a tool um which you can use to make your own twitter bot um the name which is slightly unwieldy is also slightly inaccurate they're not cheap you know obviously the service is free to use um and I thought I would do the fun thing of uh, doing a live demo of making a Twitter bot here. 
Um, so yeah, like just to show you kind of what the process looks like and demonstrate that it is very, very quick and very easy. Um, does anyone have any suggestions about what this Twitter bot should be about? <laughs> Pumpkin spice. Uh, what was your what was your suggestion? I don't want to do that. That's too depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Course titles. Oh, okay. Um, cool. I think I'm gonna go with pumpkin spice because I can imagine a way to write that in a super quick way. Um, so yeah. So uh, I previously created this Twitter account uh, just like an hour ago. Um, so you can you can follow this bot I made in a talk if you want. Uh, and we can rename it and rename the, the bot title later. Um, but so I'm going to click on create a thing, click on authorize account, and you log in. Um, so Cheatbots is, is super focused on trying to make this not scary for people. Um, I think that's like one of the overriding desi um, design aims. It's like if you don't think you know about coding, then you're still fine with this. You still have to deal with coding a bit because you know there's you're writing in JSON. Um, so you still have to grapple with syntax, but you know, the, the, the wording is very careful to not let you know that. Um, that's also the reason that for example this text here is not fixed fixed width characters and doesn't have any syntax highlighting. Um, just because if you see that then you're like, oh this is code. I won't understand this. Uh, so instead it's you know normal characters. So you're like, oh yeah, no I I, I can deal with this weird stuff. Um, and there's like obvious stuff just trying to keep keep it so that like this is the entire page like that's that's all the controls that you see um, and it's kind of some of this stuff has kind of grown over a while um, but I mean basically you you edit some text here and then some example tweets will appear here um, so the way we we write this stuff is using a um, a library for making generative text called tracery um, this is by Kate Compton um, and it's, uh, I mean, another reason I did Cheap Bots Done Quick is because I was aware of Tracery and I was actually just a huge fan of it. And it, it was super exciting in terms of how accessible it made making this kind of stuff and how, I mean, I, you kind of look at it and there was a kind of thing that I definitely heard from from people looking at it and they're like, well, this is cool, but like, I don't need to use this. I could just write some stuff that generates stuff and I can do more interesting stuff with it than just the kind of basic kind of combinatoric thing um, that it does. And I'm like, no, that's exactly why it's exciting because it it lowers the bar of what of what you need to do in order to create it. You can just slip stuff in without having to, and, and I definitely find there's a thing where um, I am capable of kind of being in a writing mode and I'm capable of being in a coding mode. But if I start thinking like a coder, then I stop doing any writing. Um, so tracery is useful, really useful for me because it lets me make procedure generated stuff without thinking about it in terms of code and getting obsessed with like trying to write good code. Instead, I'm just like, no, it's messy, but it, it works. Um, anyway, so the, the way that tracery works is, um, let me actually make this a bit bigger and easier to see. Um, so it always starts at origin um, and then it will go through this list and randomly pick one of the options. Uh, so if I generate it, you can see there's an equal chance it'll do, this could be a tweet, this is something tweet, or something completely different. So I can edit it and I can reduce down this list. So it just says this could be a tweet. And now this is the only thing it will ever, ever say. Um, and I think it's super important that there's there's a bunch of explanation here and there's some links to tutorials as how to use tracery, but like when you first log in and this is a fresh login to this to this service with this account, you get an example that already works and already shows you a bunch of the features in tracery. So I mean I'm looking through like the kind of logs of how people have created their bots and a bunch of them still have these the existing code there that's just been adapted a bit to have their content in instead, but they've still got the same kind of names they're using and the same kind of stuff within it. Um, anyway, yeah, to get back to get back to making our pumpkin spice bot, let's let's do. Pumpkin spice thing. And now 
now we have a cut error because of the comma. Now we have pumpkin spice and then these double brackets that mean that that symbol is missing. So when it encounters a thing surrounded by hashes, it will then go look for another another node in this uh, and try to pick things at random from that and then recurse down so you can kind of make these intricate structures where some things are kind of hidden by probabilities and some things are easier to find. Uh, so we have thing, we have list. So now pumpkin spice and then there's nothing in this list so it'll never come up, thing. Uh, right, uh, now people need to start yelling out things and I'll type them in here. I don't know why I decided to do like live coding and demo stuff when I can't type, but uh, some more. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put pumpkin in. <laughs> okay, so yeah, now we have, now we have, every time I press refresh, we have a randomly generated pumpkin spiced thing. Uh, so yeah, you can, already you can start to see this. And this already is like, just, just funny enough to almost start to count as being worth making a Twitter bot for. Um, and obviously you can expand out this list and then you can kind of have stuff where you change the phrasing round. So you say, uh, so already you've got like, oh, these two forms and and then you can uh, do stuff like you say, well, the thing, but with pumpkin spice, maybe that's a, wea a slightly weird phrasing, but you know, it's nice to have the variation. So you can change the probability of each thing showing up. And this is kind of a, a good example of this kind of like hackiness of just trying to sham stuff together. The way you make stuff more or less likely is you just copy and paste one of the things. So when it randomly selects it, it randomly selects that one four times as often because there's four copy and pastes of it. Uh, So yeah, look, it's skewed random number generator. I think there is actually better uh, syntax for this in tracery, um, but I've never used it and I can't remember how it works. Um, this works fine and I've made uh, actually quite horrifyingly complex things using this basic principle. Um, yeah, and obviously you can use the kind of recursive thing to allow this to be even more complicated. And there's some other kind of more advanced features in, in tracery, but the fact that it is so accessible, the fact that you can just go, oh, hey, yeah, it would be funny if this thing was slotted in and, oh, you can do this variation. Like, I think that's super important. And obviously as you're typing, you can see it just pops up with a thing where as soon as you do a syntax error, it just pops up with, hey, there's a problem here. Um, so you've got this kind of live thing. And as you type stuff in, this thing at the bottom just randomly changes. So you get this kind of immediate feedback from the stuff you're doing. Um, cool, let's, let's set this up actually as a bot. So, uh, every three hours, no, let's set to every 10 minutes because then it'll tweet a bunch during the talk. Uh, post a talk, tweet, uh, save, and yeah, now now we have a Twitter bot. <laughs> yeah, that deserves a pause. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, is 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 really designed to try to make stuff so you can just go, oh, this would be funny, yeah, let's, let's do this, trying to keep it as low as possible. Um, but also, also I think it's important that, yeah, so it's simple, simple and accessible for novices, but also like powerful enough that I am surprised by things that people have made. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize you could do it that way, or I didn't realize you could have these kind of combinations. And there's some stuff in there that's actually slightly horrifically powerful. Um, there's support for generating SVG images within uh, Cheatbots Done Quick. Um, so that's that's a way that you can yeah you know generate images and SVG is a text-based format vector-based format for making images so that's cool um, but what you may not be aware of is that 
within SVGs, you can embed arbitrary HTML. <laughs> so you can generate SVG images that contain arbitrary HTML, which can actually call off to uh, remote servers, um, like with script tags. So you can pull in arbitrary code and you can request arbitrary things from that. You can uh, pull in web fonts to use in these images. Uh, so yeah, you can like, you can include like, you know, just normal script tags. So you can procedurally generate the JavaScript that's then generating an image on my server that then gets tweeted out as a thing. Um, yeah, so I don't make that possibility apparent really anywhere on this page. It's just kind of implied, but some people have done some really interesting stuff that kind of digs into that. Um, and there's actually some other other cool kind of stuff that's that's within Cheap Plots Done Quick. I'm just going to open up a new tab to, to show an example of this. Um, so... So there's some stuff like this, and it's kind of like, if you think about the way it generates, it's actually quite difficult to generate these um, kind of kind of things. Uh, and so the way uh, that these were generated was somebody ran a Python script to generate a really large tracery file that contains these patterns, and then it subs in random characters for it. Uh, and this is also the kind of joyous thing of having everything just be text is you can just copy and paste stuff in, you can copy and paste this into a text editor and then do, you know, find replace on stuff and then copy and paste it back in. So by keeping it to text, you can kind of use this stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, uh, can I talk any more about that? Um, yeah, so actually the other thing I'd say is um, a decision I made kind of early on, the other big kind of constraint on this was I was making it and I was aware that my attention was probably going to go away so I built it as simply as possible and I thought about what stuff I should actually pay attention to so it's built in PHP it's like with hand-coded JavaScript with a node server that just runs on cron every however often it goes there's just a cron thing that says every 10 minutes post all the ones that go every 10 minutes so I try to use the absolute simplest technology um, and absolute least amount of me having to maintain it going forwards knowing that you know it's it's got much more popular than i ever expected but still not so popular i need to actually think about scaling or hosting it on the cloud or any of that jazz just just it runs on my server in the simplest way it can um and i, I think that was a good decision like i never set up google analytics on it on the basis that what i'd do is just look at it and stress but never actually need that information uh, again i think that was that was a good good decision i made for my own future sanity um yeah so i'm actually going to go through a few uh, other kind of interesting bots made by it made with it so soft landscapes this is a bot that i made um this also uses um the svg module obviously um but so it generates these lovely um procedure generated landscapes just using the kind of text-based randomness there so this uses uh, like yeah, to generate ran to generate to generate the random numbers for how much it goes up and down and the colors and everything like that, it literally just combines the digits randomly selected, um, which I don't know either horrifies or intrigues people when they they first figure out that that's how it's done. Um, uh, Tiny Carebot is I think the most popular bot running on Cheap Bots Done Quick, um, which again yeah I think this is kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's it's a I don't know. <laughs> I, I yeah, I did not did not imagine that that this was going to happen. Uh, endless screaming is also is also very popular. Um, it has now tweets much more often than when it was first set up. <laughs> uh, many gradients is a, is another one. Uh, the one that I made whilst I was testing out the kind of. Uh, um, SVG functionality for it. I really like that most of these are super calming, gentle images that are kind of satisfying, and then some are in really ugly and garish. And every so often, I have like people I know like see one of these and then tweet at me saying, "George, this is ugly. What sorted it out?" And I'm like, "No, I love it," um, because because hiding the kind of much rarer, low po low probability stuff in there means that you appreciate it and it means that your sense of like what the bot is capable of uh, kind of expands over a reasonable range. Like you still obviously get a pretty good sense of it, you know, uh, earlier than 3,000 tweets, 30,000 tweets, but 
you know it's not instant it's not you see it and then you know you know what format they're all going to have um and that's just a fun thing to play with with generativity uh this one's just really sweet uh tiny emoji people in art galleries i think that makes you can see it better Uh, and this this one I just uh, this is the one that I point to people to as a kind of example of a, the minimal kind of um, SVG thing. So what this does is it tweets all of the uh, word it tweets all of the words that are also valid um, HTML color codes. Uh, so d that's the color of dad, color of cabbed, dad, facade, um, and the nice thing is all of these are really nice pastels because they're all you know in the top range of the hexadecimal range. Uh, so they're all actually really nice colors that kind of go well together. Um, but yeah, and obviously this is super simple. It's just a square with one of these words selected, fill the square with this color. Um, so yeah, if you do want to make SVG bots, then I recommend looking at the source code for Ash Facade. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears away from cheap bots on quick, and I'm going to... Oh, actually, fuck, I forgot to launch team. Um, so uh, go on to another project, which... I think actually, definitely in my head, I think of as as a kind of something on a spectrum with cheap bots don't quick. Yes, whatever. Uh, okay, or not, um, because I, I think I only have the Steam version installed, and Steam is giving me uh, giving me problems. Um, so I'll just talk about this this for a bit instead. Um, in fact, I'll get up the website at least. So this is uh, Panoramical, which I did a, a guest scene for. Um, so Panoramical is this kind of um, so it's it's a game by. <laughs> noises um so this is a game um uh, by david kanega and Fern fernando romalo so this is kind of um it was originally made for a uh, korg nano control so it had uh eight sliders and eight knobs and so you just control the parameters on um these different kind of landscapes so it's a project they did and they did a bunch of scenes for it and then they invited uh, me and yuko yuko Kalio to co contribute a scene for it um so with Within this, you're just controlling this parameter, these these different um, shapes within it, um, and this is this is a commercially re released video game. But definitely, the way I thought about it is it's also a tool. It's a tool for for making these wonderful vi visuals, and it's again a tool tool for um, kind of casual creators in the same kind of way. Um, it's a tool for yeah, like you can open it up and not know what you're making, and by messing around with the tool, discover what you want to make. Um, and most of the time that you think of tools, um, definitely there's a kind of, kind of classic UX kind of thing of like, uh, when you open this up, can a user achieve the aims they were going into this game, like setting out to do? Um, and I think often this ignores that often you open up stuff and you don't know what you want to do and the tool kind of guides you. Um, and this is kind of very much on one end of this, but cheap bots as well also. You're like, I want to make a bot. So you open it up and you start messing around with it. You're like, oh yeah, now, now I have an idea for what I actually want to make with it. Um, and so within this, you're just trying to, you're exploring a kind of um, state space of all of these kind of uh, 18 different parameters. Um, so if you think about it, this ends up with this huge kind of combinatorial space. Um, and the stuff I did um, used uh, image effects, so shaders, uh, in, order to, in order to do this. So I had a stacked sequence of shaders within this. Um, so as you did this, you controlled the parameters of the different shaders. And you could also uh, change one knob that would change the order they were stacked in, which kind of dramatically changed this. And I tried to kind of hit this middle ground of um, both having some sense of what the parameter did, like you control this and it controls like the diameter of a circle you see. <coughs> but also you don't know exactly the way this stacks up, so you can't quite predict it. So you're exploring the space and you, you start to get the kind of shape of the bones of it, but you, you again, there's there's surprise hidden within it and the randomness ends up giving you kind of uh, new stuff 
new stuff to find within it. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you another thing that hopefully will actually work. Uh, so this is another thing, again, kind of uh, playing with shaders a bit. Um, so this is based on, I, sh I showed it to you briefly, the uh, mini gradients Twitter account. So it was kind of trying to make a more advanced version of that, that I ended up making this. Um, so this again, um, I mean, this is kind of an thing. Obviously, it still uses random generation to try to generate what colors come up there. Um, but I was trying to, uh, with this project, I was trying to think about, so one of actually the design prompts was, like, what would a video game that you played whilst you were falling asleep look like? Um, you know, like, there's, there's like, you know, you read books until you fall asleep. You can, you know, listen to music whilst you fall asleep. Uh, but could you make a video game you could fall asleep to? Like, you kind of need something that instead of, I mean, most, most video games and most of the internet is designed to try to capture attention, to try to keep you clicking on stuff, keep you interacting with it kind of in this kind of compulsive loop. What about something that's kind of designed to make you, you interact with it because you're kind of anxiously interacting with it. And every time you click, it starts slowly transitioning to a new, new set of colors. Um, but could you make something that instead of that invites you to click on it slower and slower and fewer and fewer and just kind of sit and and watch it kind of slowly rotate and kind of admire the colors um and then actually as i, I worked on it i then realized i then had to like go <coughs> sorry i've got hair in my mouth um go deep kind of within shader shader land uh, actually, just in order to render nice gradients, it turns out computers still aren't capable of rendering nice gradients because there's not enough colors. Um, so you have to do all this weird like stuff with dithering to to get the gradients to look nice. Um, but yeah, so this is, and again, this has the same thing. Sometimes it can come up with uh, three different colors on a single sphere, but generally it's two. Um, and this is another actually example of um, just two randomly picked colors often will really play against each other in a really nice way um and yeah so I, I i think i've maybe succeeded at something that has this kind of calming calming feel to it um so let's just look at that for a moment whilst i turn over the sheet of paper uh so yeah um Moving on to kind of physical stuff um, and back to kind of more high intensity things. This is a Doom Piano. <coughs> As you play the piano, uh, you control the game of Doom. Fun fact about this video is the person who's playing the piano is Martin Hollis, who was the designer on Goldeneye, uh, which I don't know, that has a weird like, resonance. Anyway, he can play the piano, it turns out. Um, so this is one of a number of projects I've done which involve kind of, uh, um, I think I've got a nice picture of doing piano to sit on rather than those ones. <coughs> so this is one of a number of projects I've worked on that kind of have video games and also have a kind of physical interface to it um, and sit in a physical space. Uh, most of these projects, for some reason, also have like incredibly reductively literal names. I mean, actually, that kind of continues on to Calming Sphere. Um, but yeah, Doom Piano is a piano you can play Doom on. Um, so this kind of came out of a, a jam. So I was definitely not the only person who worked on this. There was a, a bunch of us working on it. Um, my main contribution to this project was insisting that every single one of the keys had to do something within Doom. If we just did a few, then we'd be wimps and, um, you know, shirking our responsibilities as artists or something. Um, but it, it's got some kind of really interesting affordances because, like, we kept the, you know, internal piano structure there. Um, so the way it works is um, the main, like, kind of back sound plate, which is made of brass in a piano, we wired that up as ground to a keyboard encoder. And then we put copper tape on all of the hammers and then wired those up as the inputs. So every time you press on a key, the hammer contacts the string and closes the circuit. Um, but if you think about it, when you're playing Doom, normally you hold down on keys in order to move forward. So we had to actually make a hacked version of Doom where just in momentarily pressing the key gave you a little bit of velocity that slowly bled off over time. Um, 
and and actually we talked about instead of just making it as the doom piano making it as a piano controller for like particular games that would be particularly designed for being played by this piano with this particular affordance for the keys um but but actually like just hacking doom so it runs on it like works and is a better joke and is instantly recognizable um and you don't need to make a whole new game <laughs> in order to show off the cool piano controller you've got uh so i don't think we ever actually made a game that was specifically designed for the piano to run on it um so yeah um now i'm going to move on and talk about a bit about uh punch the custard so this is this is obviously the game uh, that heather was talking about um having first seen me when i was demoing so you can see it it is again very literal you are punching the custard or you're actually kind of maybe slapping it you're trying to move your fist as fast as possible not as heavily as possible uh, so as you as you play it you get periods where you have to be punching it and then periods where you know this kind of respite and you lose points if you punch it so normally you get a point every time you punch it and then you lose a point every time you do punch it in these kind of periods and the reason for that is it, it runs for a minute and a minute is a really long time to be punching again it it's really tiring your arm gets really sore uh, already people are kind of like half falling off the table as they're playing. Uh, so the only thing that the game controller is just telling you is just telling you when to punch and when not and keeping score so i used a kind of um, actually it was just around the time the makey makey came out so i didn't actually use a makey makey but basically the same technology to detect punches happening in there um so again this kind of comes back to a the theme i was talking about with the curation stuff where like the game itself is incredibly minimal um but actually the important thing is the kind of context you've got you've got two people doing a silly thing that makes a like gross squelchy slapping sound um and they're surrounded by a group of people who are cheering and clapping and paying attention and are super getting into it and that sense of like performing and that sense of doing something kind of transgressive and weird actually that's the thing that you're you're creating the, the game itself is just a context and excuse to do that um a thing that happened a bunch and that i'm absolutely not offended by is small children coming over playing a game of punch the custard and going yeah this is great and then just standing there for five minutes messing with the custard because it's this uh it's this weird non-newtonian fluid where when you punch it it goes hard and when you just put your fingers in it's kind of goopy and runny um and like absolutely that is kind of not the intended way to play it but kids coming along and actually just messing around with that seems perfectly fine i'm really just hijacking like physics um there's a cool physics thing and then i attached a game to it to give a a reason to play it and a context to mess around with it but actually the cool physics thing is is cooler than the game i made that's that's fine i'm not offended by that it's, it's physics it'll last forever <laughs> um yeah and um and i also want to show and this is actually great like we didn't like plan heather's intro versus mine at all it was kind of sprung on her last minute um yeah here's another picture of that and here's a picture of me i guess i guess like maybe the first time we met of me demoing it at the south bank center uh like this is just like a really lovely photo of me and it's also very bizarre i used it as like my photo for various things for a long time just me holding this tub of custard powder small children playing it in the background looking very serious um yeah, like I, I deliberately made sure I had, I mean, this is the other thing in terms of like context is like, you know, I deliberately made sure I was wearing an apron, like the custard didn't go anywhere. I didn't need the apron, but if you come up and someone is running a game and they've got an apron and, you know, there's a tablecloth on the table and there's like some wooden spoons lying around and you're going to punch in some mixing bowls. It gives this whole like vibe to the whole affair that just, just the game itself really doesn't have and kind of. Uh, the sense of like thinking about the game both as a way to make context and a way to kind of extend the context that you approach it with like the, the moment the game begins is when you first uh, first see the name punch the custard or first see it across the room actually the game doesn't begin when you know i press the button and go yes go you know it, it starts earlier than that and you should think about designing it earlier than that um so yeah i'm going to talk about one final kind of physical product and this is the one uh, that I've been working on for the last couple of years. This is uh, Beasts of Balance. Oh, actually, I was going to mute this. That's just for soundtrack to it. 
so this is what I've been working on, um, kind of, I guess, guess as, as my day job for the last couple of years, has been working as the designer and doing a bunch of the coding on this game. So this is a digital physical stacking game. So you stack pieces up on the, on the little kind of plinth there uh, in order to, and actually I was just this last weekend demoing the game at PAX Unplugged. So I feel myself slipping into like my show spiel here. Um, but yeah, it's a digital physical stacking game where you're trying to fill the world with the most amazing beasts you can by stacking stuff up on this tower. And then when it falls over, the game ends. Or you actually, when it falls over, you then have seven seconds to frantically try to scramble to put everything back on there. Um, and this is this is a commercial product that came out last year, so we're selling it for money. You can you can go buy it. Um, please do. It's, it's a good game, I think, <laughs> which I would say. Um, and this is obviously super interesting, taking a lot of the kind of lessons I learned from these kind of shonky like installation games, kind of Punch the Custard um, and Doom Piano and kind of related games, taking that kind of stuff and trying to apply it actually to a commercial context and trying to deal with all the stuff of like dealing with getting injection molding in China and putting a game into shops like it's in the Apple store, like the amount of logistics in that. I'm, obviously not been like directly dealing with all of that, but that's been fascinating to kind of see. Um, and I think a lot of the lessons have kind of been transferable and like, I don't know, it's it's been interesting working on Beasts of Balance as when I started it, I thought I was making a video game. I kind of vaguely consider um, Doom Piano and uh, Punch the Custard as video games because I came from a video game context when I was making them. And as I was working on Beasts of Balance, I was kind of going, Half, uh, I had a realization like halfway through, like, oh no, this is a board game. This is this is actually a stacking game that just happens to have a digital component. And then we work on it even longer. And then I had another realization, which was like, oh no, this isn't a video, a video game or a board game. This is a toy because you can play with it in a kind of free kind of way. You know, the actual rules that you have for it are not are not the important thing. The important thing is it just provides this context for play, and it just allows people to mess around. And you know, there's there's a bunch of ways you can cheat. Um, which is kind of interesting because w as long as the you know tablet thinks that what you're doing is fine, then it doesn't matter about what you do. Like there's a challenge piece where you have to play one-handed and you have to have one hand on the screen and stack with the other hand. And almost everyone cheats this. And you know if you're playing with people, s someone will have their hand on it and then someone will be stacking with two hands. Um, but the sense of cheating the computer is still is still good and still transgressive. And some people play it you know like the proper way. Um, I don't know, but I find that find that super fascinating. Um, and again, thinking about it, not as the thing that the thing that's good about it is not not necessarily the game. I think the game is good, but is actually just it gives you a context for sitting around and for playing with people. Like um, most of the time, there's no like time limit on it. You can take as long as you like. You can pass turns around however you like. That stuff isn't should just be mediated socially. And actually, what we're providing is a chance to sit around and do a exciting thing in the context of hanging out with your family or your friends and drinking or yeah um another kind of uh lesson which which i definitely kind of learned from punch the custard and from doom piano um and which definitely applies to piece of balance is when you're making digital physical stuff you need to be think really carefully about where people's attention should be at any particular moment um so with a video game you still need to direct people's attention but generally their attention is on the screen and then they're using the controller and there's this awkward bit at the beginning where people don't know how to use a controller and they need to look down and then look up and the experience is kind of terrible until they've got some muscle memory and they don't need to look at the controller. With this, you, you definitely need to look at the stack that you're building. Um, and so we, we deliberately have the game kind of, kind of quiet and boring when you should be looking at the tower and then after you finish doing a thing, then there's motion and noise and you look at that and see what happens there. Um, but again, this is kind of this sense of um, with most video games, multiplayer video games, you're generally focusing your attention on the screen. So everyone's focusing their attention on the screen and, you know, you're playing with the people in the room, but you're not looking at them. With this, this is a game that you play on a table where you're surrounding it. So you look at the thing you're stacking, but you also, you know, look at the faces of the people you're playing with. And that changes the kind of experience a lot. And I think is is a really cool thing from kind of traditional video games. Um, and obviously this kind of thinking leads back into the kind of curation work and the kind of thing about creating spectacles for people to see and how can we create places where people are having fun together as opposed to staring at the screen. Obviously we still have traditional video games there because a lot of them are great, 
but definitely thinking about ways that you can shift people's attention like into the room and into the space they're actually in and onto each other is kind of just just as interesting and an interesting challenge kind of away from that um some other themes from kind of the physical stuff i've built i'll just go through a few more of these is um one thing that's really lovely is this kind of um sense of magic of just like oh i don't know i'm doing a thing and then something else happens somewhere else immediately um like beasts of balance you stack a thing on and then the tablet knows how does it know it's not even connected there's nothing attached obviously it's bluetooth i mean that's fine uh, people understand bluetooth but there's still a sense of magic because actually a lot of it comes down just to latency if if the thing happens immediately afterwards then it feels magical if it happens after half a second's delay then suddenly not magical um with punch the custard obviously there's the wires but at the same time like not normally the computer doesn't go beep when you plunge your hand into a bowl of like weird orange liquid um so you've still got this kind of sense of magic a sense of like beep 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 what <laughs> uh and with doom piano obviously like the fact that the wires to show how it's made is kind of hidden inside so you're playing a piano and the computer's responding like you know if you're technically literate you can kind of think about it and kind of go oh i see how it would work but that's not kind of your instinctive response so there's still this kind of sense of magic and this sense of moment there um another thing is kind of um i definitely think in terms of like jokes i definitely think in terms of like i don't know like punch the custard is basically structured as a joke it's like what's the game punch the custard what do you do you punch custard like <laughs> um beast of balance has a lot of jokes just yeah just stupid stuff where you've set up a situation and then you've subverted those expectations and I, I definitely think about that in terms of like what moments are you trying to build into the game um and often the answer is you're trying to build in just just kind of stupid jokes of you do a thing and then it the thing you're told would happen does happen and it's not what you expected um so yeah that's that's i think basically what i've got going got to do um i'm sorry i didn't get to show you panoramical um but it's it's it looks nice there's some nice shaders sorry there were some good colors you missed out on um but yeah that's that's basically a kind of tour of the different kind of bits of work i've done um thank you all for listening <laughs>